You're listening to a podcast from the Brookings Institution. It's now well understood that inequality has risen substantially in the US over the past couple of decades. But there are in fact two things that could be underlying that. It could be that for each of us, maybe our incomes have gotten more volatile. What that would mean is there are some years in which you get a big bonus and then you'd show up as being rich. There'd be more rich people. Other years, you don't do so well and you'd show up as being poor. As a result, there'd be more poor people. And the effect of that rising volatility of individual incomes would be to make it look as if overall income inequality in the United States had grown. The second possibility is that what's happened is people who are rich have gotten even richer and they're going to stay that way through their whole lives. People who are poor, even poorer, they're going to stay that way through their whole lives. In order to disentangle the two, we'd need rich data following the same people over time. That's exactly what these authors have. They've actually got the underlying tax data, so this is the perfect data for understanding inequality. And they're able to use it to decompose inequality into its permanent component versus the part that's due to rising volatility. What they find is almost all of the rise in income inequality over the past few decades has been due to the permanent component of income becoming even more unequal across people. This is even more reason to worry about inequality. It's not just year-to-year -year ups and downs that have gotten worse. It's actually the rich are getting richer and staying richer. The poor, poorer, and staying poorer. Now, the tax system is somewhat helpful here. Yes, we have progressive taxes in the United States, and were it not for that, the authors show us, income inequality would have grown by more. But the tax system is not enough to overcome the, under, the, the overwhelming economic force through this period, which is for income inequality to have risen. And so what, it's still risen substantially even on an after-tax basis. So money market funds were a really important way that corporations fund themselves. You and I store our money in the bank. Corporations store them in money market funds. The problem that money market funds face, and the big problem during the financial crisis, is just as there can be a run on the bank, there can be a run on the money market fund. And this was a huge, hugely important precipitating event in the last financial crisis that it looked like money market funds might break the buck. What that means is too many people want to withdraw their money at the same time, and therefore the fund needs to liquidate some of its assets at fire sale prices. It doesn't have enough money to go around for everyone, and not everyone's going to get fully repaid. And that causes a panic, and even more people want to leave the money market fund. The policy question here is how can we stop a bank run on a money market? The basic insight here is, that with no regulation, we all face an incentive to try to be the first person to leave the money market. What we want to do is withdraw my money today before everyone else withdraw withdraws their money. If I've withdrawn my money first, I face none of the risk. And this in itself then makes the system even more fragile as we're all in a race to be the first to withdraw money, our money, before the, system, before the money market fail fund fails. So what the authors propose is a very clever idea. Sure, you can go ahead and withdraw your money when you need it, but you have to leave a small proportion behind that stays at risk. You can withdraw your money, but you can't escape the risk that comes with it. And so what that means is there's no longer an incentive for you to want to be the first person out rather than the last person to withdraw from the money market fund because both of you will end up having to leave a small amount of money at risk just in case there's a run. Now this reduces the incentive to run and that hopefully makes money market funds more robust and will reduce the possibility of future runs on money markets. Portugal is really an amazing story, a very sad story, but an important story. What too few people recognize is just how bad things have been in Portugal. This isn't just about the economic crisis, it's actually about the whole decade leading up to it. Over the past 12 years, economic growth in Portugal has been worse than it was in the US in 12 years around the Great Depression. It's been worse than it was in Japan in the 12 years around the last decade. A truly abysmal performance. So what's going on? Ricardo Rees looks at this very carefully and notes that Portugal, in fact, uh, uh, that Portugal had a period of very strong capital inflows. So a lot of money coming into the country the problem, as he sees it, is Portugal has a fairly underdeveloped financial system. So that attracted money towards the non-tradable or service sectors, and that in turn caused the real exchange rate to rise. In turn, that's uh, led to resources to come away from the tradable sector. Basically, a lot of the money ended up in the least productive parts of the Portuguese economy. A lot of investment in lower productivity firms actually lowers Portugal's overall productivity. Combine that with the fact that they've had a 
uh, fairly strong rises in taxes, and you start to get a sense of why it is the Portuguese economy has grown so slowly. It's important to understand this because Portugal stands apart from the other poor performers in Europe. So we're probably not surprised to see Italy have, have done so poorly given its political dysfunction. Or Spain and Ireland, they make sense given the huge house price bubbles that those countries had. Portugal experienced neither of these, but instead there's a whole different disease going on, and it's the problem of underperforming investment. Family planning is very much in the news right now. We hear about Republican attempts to defund Planned Parenthood. We hear about cons concerns about Obamacare and whether that should cover contraception. And it may be that uh, how we fund and regulate family planning has really important larger scale economic and social implications. And so that's what Martha Bailey does. She tries to figure out whether that's true by looking back to economic history. The last times that we've had such virulent debates and large-scale social experiments were back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. We saw Griswold versus Connecticut, which was the first time that uh, which the Supreme Court struck down state bans on contraception. And then subsequently we saw the expansion of federal family planning programs. And Martha really asks, what is it we can learn from this period in US history? And the results are fascinating. It's easy to see that uh, family planning would have, have an effect on the fertility rate. But I think what we care more about is the circumstances in which kids grow up. And here she finds very large effects. When you allow family planning or you encourage family planning, kids are much less likely to grow up in poverty, much less likely to grow up uh, on welfare or with their parents on welfare. And generally it looks like this, this, the, the environment within which they grow up and the investments which their parents are willing to make in them rises substantially. It's not just which kids are or aren't being born, it's that parents, when given the, the opportunity to choose when to have their kids, are choosing to have them at a time of life when they're willing, able, and have the financial resources to make investments in them. The results in this paper are stunning. The big picture question here is, why don't we see smart, working class kids in our very best colleges? And in fact, we know our very best colleges are trying to find these kids. You might think that it's due to the price of college. You might think that there are other things discouraging them. In fact, it's where and how they choose to apply. Carolyn Hawksby and Chris Avery look at every single college application in the United States. They zero in on that subset of kids who are sort of A minus GPAs and very strong SAT or ACT scores. The high achievers who should be able to get into the very best schools and look what is it they choose to do. Many of these kids don't apply to college at all. Quite a few apply to the nearby community college rather than an Ivy League. Uh, Take a, a similar kid from a rich household, he or she will be applying to uh, a couple of reach schools, uh, a few match schools and maybe a safety school in case things don't work out. The equivalent kid from a working class family, maybe will apply to, what, to uh, the best school they'll apply to would be what, you, what people might think of as being a safety school, a school that services kids who really aren't as talented as many of these kids are. And the puzzle's even deeper when you realise it's not just these smart working class kids are qualified to do well. We also know that those who end up going to the very best schools and the selective schools ultimately do well and they graduate on time and successfully. But in fact, many of these selective schools are cheaper for working class kids than are the less selective schools they end up choosing because of course they have enormous scholarship aid. So then the challenge that Hoxby and Avery throw out is there are a large number of very talented working class kids. Colleges aren't finding them, they're not applying, and so what colleges have got to do is try and make the case to them. Find where these kids are and, and show them that they could in fact succeed if they were applying to selective schools. The authors are interested in understanding financial inclusion around the world. How much do different people in different countries have access to the financial system? This is important because being able to save in a bank account or alternatively being able to borrow can help get you through bad times. They can help you start a business. They can help you save for a rainy day. So their research approach, fantastic. They, they want to know about financial inclusion, so they go to 148 countries around the world and add new survey questions uh, asking about financial inclusion. So for every country around the world now, we have a wide variety of new measures of financial inclusion. The headline facts here are fascinating. Around about half of us have access to the banking system or the financial system in our countries. Almost all of us in the developed world and actually less than half in the developing world. Men are more likely to have access than are women. And then we've got a whole range. This research brings a whole range of new indicators of financial inclusion 
that other researchers can use in our, uh, in our own studies. So if you want to figure out the effects of financial inclusion on anything from women's independence to economic growth, what you can now do is take the data that these authors have painstakingly put together and use them to try and understand what it is that financial inclusion buys us.